Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Omni Athlete. If you're here, it's because like us, you believe that sport is a vehicle for elevating global consciousness. But you know that elevating global consciousness through sport only matters if it actually helps you to achieve a peak performance state, get in the zone, and compete at your highest level. We created this show to highlight the highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors to unveil for you the side of sports that most never see and rarely know exists. Okay, guys, so today's guest, uh, I'm super excited for you to get a chance to listen to and and really dive into his world. Uh, He is a world-renowned singing and performance coach, and what I think is really important for you guys to know going into this episode, you have to let go of the notion that singing and being a vocal athlete is any different than being an athlete, period. You know, this gentleman, not only is a is he a world-renowned singing coach, but he is a performance and peak performance specialist and former high-level athlete himself. Uh, he's worked with extremely talented and successful performers across the globe, including, I think, over 132 different countries. He's actually worked with uh, peak performers in both singing and just performance in general and uh, what you will hear as you dive into this interview and and his um, the perspective that you're going to understand as he speaks is that performance number one is a choice and that if you make the decision to let go of the idea of controlling the outcome and really just embrace the process of becoming better at whatever your performance endeavor is you can choose to step into peak performance and realize what it feels like to be in that moment of flow and effortlessly perform at your peak, which is awesome because at the SEC group and Omni Athlete, what we believe more than anything is that peak performance is a choice. So guys, welcome to the show, Per Baristo. Enjoy this episode. And as always, if this adds value to your lives, share and subscribe to our uh, podcast on iTunes. Well, Pierre, I, I am pleased, honored, and thrilled to be talking with you because looking into your, your background, your ex- expertise, you're singing with freedom, you're speaking with freedom, you're a performance coach, you're a voice coach, you touch all the bases, and there are, I guess, many universalities in your, in your field of expertise, aren't there? Well, yes, and uh, I'm really honored to be part of this because a lot of what I do, I draw from my sports background, but it's really interesting when it comes to speaking and singing uh, in relation to performance because those are often the things that we fear a lot. So it really uh, ties into uh, the aspects of sports performance, sports psychology, and how we can actually perform in any area of life and how we can grow under pressure and all these things. So it's, it's an exciting subject matter. Yeah, sure. Now, you, you have performance anxiety or people who are ready to seize the moment, the carpe diem on stage or on the ball field or in the corporate meeting room. Talk about some of the commonalities in that success and some of the pitfalls for people who are overwhelmed in those moments. Yeah, and there's a reason why you mentioned my, my, my training. I've used the word freedom, right? Sing with freedom, speak with freedom, perform with freedom, because I think that's what we would like to experience. And if we could experience that in those moments under pressure, when it really matters the most, when things are on the line, first of all, that's a beautiful feeling, but that also gives us the results that we want. And that's easier said than done, of course. And that obviously applies to any area of life. And I don't think we really are trained to do that. We hear about we're supposed to have, you know, we're supposed to learn from failure and we're supposed to be tough and all that kind of stuff. But what is that really? So I think it really does apply to all these areas, like you mentioned, you know, on the sports field and in that crucial moment of a game or when you're stepping up on stage and it's the one, that one moment you need to seize the opportunity or if you're in a crisis situation in a business or you, or you have a really important negotiation, whatever it might be. And it ties into communication in my, in my field also, right? But um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Well, and explore that idea of the freedom. What exactly do you mean when you say sing with speak, uh, freedom, speak with freedom, perform with freedom? Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. So what is that feeling that we would like to accomplish, right? Often we feel tension, often we feel restriction, and of course, often we feel enormous amount of fear. Uh, As a matter of fact, fear is is one of those subject matters that I think are really important to to talk about. Because I think perhaps even more so for guys, and um, 
that we've grown up with some kind of belief that experiencing fear is a sign of weakness or something. And then we're supposed to be tough when we don't experience fear or when we hide it. I happen to think it's probably the other way around that the more awareness, the greater awareness we can uh, develop around fear. Um, first of all, the more we can succeed in life, but also the freer we feel, then therefore we're not afraid of, we don't need to hide, we don't need to act tough when we're not, you know, it's all these kind of things. We, we don't like to wor use the word for fear. I don't want to say I'm afraid. I want to use other words, um, which is unfortunate. But I think that that also leads to a lot of problems, personal problems and uh, aggression towards ourselves, aggression to other people and so forth. So, so I think freedom is, I mean, it's tied into awareness and the, the whole thing that you're talking about in, in this video series with everyone else that you've talked to, uh, it's a fascinating subject matter. And I think we're all aware of that, the mindfulness, the, the awareness of, of body and mind, but also about our psychology and our emotions and how we actually then not only perform in a, on the in the sports field or in the, on the arena, but actually how we can live more fulfilled lives also. So, uh, yeah, so freedom, we might experience freedom differently, but I, I think uh, w when we feel it, it's a wonderful feeling. Now, now go back to our friend and colleague, Christian Ulmer, who wrote the book, Art of Fear, and talks about dancing with fear rather than suppressing, repressing, denying it. So give me your take on the whole concept of fear because you know, uh, performance anxiety is a big component, whether it's you know, yes. we spoke of uh, mm -hmm. in the ball field, in the corporate arena, on the stage, wherever one, one might have it. Fear is, in some ways, omnipresent. It's what we do with it that defines us in many ways. Yes, yes, indeed, right? And when I met Kristen, I said that she stole my title. But... <laughs> <laughs> No, but she, she's, uh, it's interesting. And I have a lot of friends who are in the extreme sports world, and it's interesting how we deal with fears. And uh, so Kristen has a wonderful uh, message there. Um, so in my world, then, it's interesting that public speaking is known as one of the greatest fears. And why is that? Very, very fascinating. Well, if, if you look at it, we're all wired. We all want to belong. We all want to fit in. We all want to be loved. And how do we accomplish that? Well, as a matter of fact, when we're children, when we're, when we're young, a great strategy in order to fit in, in order to be loved, in order to belong, is frankly to be quiet. Isn't that interesting? You know, a child is supposed to be seen and not heard. We, we're growing up with that. And, and expressing our opinion, expressing our voice in that situation can be kind of threatening or it can be disturbing or whatever it might be, right? So as, as children, we often take on that role that is, I mean, it depends on, on what kind of environment we grow up with, obviously. But, but being silent can frankly be safer. Uh, not voicing our opinion, not expressing. And even when we do physical activities, which in theory is not about the voice, but it's still about expressing something. It is still about connecting with human beings. It's still about belonging. Sometimes we, we become athletes because we want to show off and we want to be noticed. Sometimes we get up on stage and sing because we want to show off and we want to be noticed many times towards the opposite sex. And it's, it's a function of our, our humanity. It's, so let's, let's, uh, let's not pretend it's not. It's part of it, right? We somehow want to do maneuver the world and try to connect and try to be part of it. And that's why, of course, team activities, team sports are so powerful also. And, um, um, but then, um, yeah, so when we recognize that, so if, if, if I jump ahead, then if I talk about the performance anxiety, um, for someone who's speaking on stage, we have now psychologically put us, ourselves in a situation where I feel now that I have to prove myself in order to belong, in order to be fit in, in order to get the applause, in order to be recognized, right? And the fear of being rejected then is, is then um, embedded in us. I have to do something in order. So therefore, I step up on stage with that fear, with that performance anxiety. And if things don't go well, now that's very interesting what happens then, right? Because now we feed that fever, sort of the, <laughs> the memories of what happened. Um, I'm going off on tangents here now, but can I tell you a story when I was 11, 11 years old? Please. Because this was one of my defining moments. I still remember it so well. Um, because I was, I was considered a, a child prodigy playing the violin. And I, I never 
like the word talent. I've always been a skill developer. I love to develop skills. And I'm really grateful that I found that passion for developing skills. And I was trying to figure out strategies of how to learn to play the violin um, rather than relying on this word, so-called talent, natural, all that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. When I had my first violin recital, I noticed something very, very interesting. Uh, first of all, this, this hand that's supposed to move, and I have to move, uh, you know, put the fingers in the right spot, I started sweating like crazy. I, I didn't even know that hands could sweat. I didn't, I didn't know that you could sweat more on one hand than the other. <laughs> How's that possible? Right? How's that possible? Suddenly these fingers that are so I started, I can't slip around and all sweaty fingers, right? That was remarkable. But there was still something inside of me that knew I, 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 I could do that. But the other thing also, I had decided that I was going to play this piece um, by heart. I wasn't going to uh, look at the sheet music. Um, and I was 11 years old. So why I made that decision, I don't know. But there's something with my, tr my, uh, my teacher. He said that you'll be freer when you do that. And when, and when I practiced doing that, I kind of felt that also. But rather than having a visual thing, have to look at something, to follow something, um, let me do it without it. And that was such an amazing learning experience because even in practice, I had learned that if, as soon as my mind jumped ahead to what I, some, a few measures ahead, if I would mess up. But if I could stay then in the moment, which I'm sure we're going to talk more about when it comes to peak performance psychology, right, being able to get into this, that zone. But um, then if I would trust, my fingers will know what to do once I get there. But if I start figuring out thinking ahead, it, it would mess everything up. So in that first recital, I had both the experience of the sweaty fingers and the fear that I was experienced beforehand, plus um, the actual performance where I, had, where I f was able then to stay in the moment, to go with the flow, and, and, it, was, it, and it went very well, which I'm grateful for. Uh, but it was a beautiful learning experience, and I've used it ever since, and everything I, I do then. So how can we train ourselves so that we can do that and on e even higher levels? Um, but anyway, so that was a little bit of my, my starting point, understanding a little bit of the, the fear and how we, what we do with it right. and so forth. And, and, and the mind can get in the way of the intrinsic flow that with proper practice, and I know you talk much about the process and developing the right skill set to a, a level of expertise, then just trust that instinct, trust that developed sense. Yes, yes, trust is huge. Um, I'm not a fan of the word control. Uh, in the singing world, they've heard a lot about control, controlling your breath, breath control, controlling the tone, controlling the frequency, controlling your whatever. And uh, I always say that the, the, to me, the word control implies something being held, right? And if it, it really, the need to control really implies the fear of being out of control. So what I encourage my, my artists, speakers, performers is that if we can let go of the need to control, frankly, be out of control, <laughs> you're actually going to experience something amazing. And therefore, you start trusting that instead. So we replace that, the need to control with trust. There's something very exciting is going to happen when you're in that moment. And then that becomes life. That becomes spontaneity. That becomes creativity. That becomes then, um, yeah, whatever it might be, right? And frankly, I think that applies to sports also. Sure. And I think when you allow that flow state to blossom, the best of you will emerge because you are prepared for that moment. And rather than thinking it through or methodically referencing your, your notes on a page or your, you know, rummaging through your mind, and, okay, I've got to be at this angle for the delivery of a pitch or whatever it might be, you get in your own way. Right. Yes, don't you? And you're, right, and you're right. Preparation is, of course, crucial. But then once we get into the moment to let go of that and uh, recognize that whatever I know up to this point, if I, if I then trust the process and trust whatever's going to happen is going to happen, um, magic may very well happen.
Yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's it's easier said than done. So that's why you have a great career because so many people have that block or, or have that lack of confidence or awareness that if you follow the method, you will shine brighter. But what are some of the sticking points that you've worked on to help people unlock some of those challenges? Well, that's, I think the it, it, first of all, it comes from we all want to be good, right? So this was a little bit of also my learning experience and my dilemma, frankly, when I was a kid, because I, since everybody told me I was so talented, um, then you come to believe that I have to be good all the time. So when I got into sports, first of all, I wasn't considered all that talented, but I became pretty good on, on a youth youth level, but I, and I was good in school. And so, so something in your brain says, I have to be good all the time, right? But that also because it creates pressure. So it's, and singers then, singers are the worst because singers always wants to sound good. And traditional singing training has always been about trying to match notes and trying to do st stuff to sound better and better. And my whole method has changed that whole philosophy because I say, okay, let's give ourselves permission, permission to sound like shit. Now <laughs> that's, uh, and, you know, so, someone hears that first time. It's like, Oh, well, what I'm paying you to sound good. That can't be right. Yeah. But, uh, but of course it only takes a few seconds until you realize, wow, that's kind of freeing in and of itself. For the first time in my life, I give myself permission to, sound whatever now when we get into that frame of mind that mind mind mindset that state of mind then of course we can discover things about our physical instrument to start off with physical body which is what we use in as a vocal athlete or an athlete in any other situation we can now develop awareness of the physical aspect of it without the need to perform without the need to be good. So that's, I think, is such an important first point. Can we give ourselves permission to not measure, judge the so-called result? What you think the result is, right? Where the ball is gonna land or what it is. Yeah, but if, if I'm gonna throw a ball, is it where the ball lands? Is that the result? Or is it what the hips are doing in the moment? Is that where I want to shift my focus? And since we have this amazing brain that can shift our focus to various things, right? If we can remove ourselves from that so-called outcome, from the result, and actually experience the process, now we can so much quicker actually experience the result that we want in it. But it starts with giving ourselves permission. So kind of the stripped down get out of your own way approach. Now I heard you talk at, with the urban monk about the five-year-old, I don't know if it was your son or referencing just in general, about trying to catch the ball thrown pretty hard to him. And you weren't concerned if he caught it, but just developing the awareness of what to do, again, focusing on the process, not the outcome. And that was kind of a microcosmic view of a lot of your teaching and coaching, correct? Yes, yes. Yes, and it's interesting. As a, as a dad, I've been following uh, the, the sports world, um, uh, how, how coaches and kids uh, approach uh, skill development as well as performance. So with my, with, my, with my two boys, I had, yeah, I think that example was to, to catch a ball, right? So it started off by throwing socks when they were, before they could even walk, right? When it was just a fun game. It was never about the result of catching anything. It was just about seeing things coming at you and becoming comfortable with that. Later on, wiffle balls, tossing them at your face. And we had like, he had a ba baseball glove and it was never about catching. I would never say, oops, if I, he dropped it, I never said, yay, if he caught it. Making that result completely irrelevant. Instead, folk say, okay, let's pretend you're a hockey goalie here. And then I'm going to toss things at you and you're just protecting your face. But when he's three years old, he can't even, his hand isn't strong enough to even close the glove. So if the ball sticks in the glove, it's irrelevant, right? The thing is to be able to be comfortable with things coming at you. But before that, I should back up. Uh, before that, I used to have when they were sitting down, rolling balls at them. And I painted a dot of color on the ball. And then I say, I call out the color before it reaches your hand. But if people saw me do that ac exercise, then they would probably not uh, understand what the, pro what, what the purpose of the exercise. Yes, hand-eye coordination, fine. But the real purpose of the exercise was I never, ever checked if they were right or wrong. 
And that was really the exercise because then we're training them to get out of the, uh, to not, uh, and I was rolling balls fast so they wouldn't even have time to check if they were right or wrong. Very, very important. So therefore not getting into the idea of judgment, what's right or wrong, good or bad, success or failure, instead training to become part of the process. At the same time, or, or therefore, being more aware of their senses, what's going on, the coordination and so forth. And then later on with the tossing. And then, yeah, when the hand gets strong, it gets stuck in the glove. And that's what happens. But I would never, even a little bit later, if we were throwing catch, never ever react to, oops, you dropped the ball, which, which most kids do, right? They think they've suddenly done something wrong. And the brain becomes so trained uh, about judging right or wrong, success or failure. And that's not what it's about. So then, yeah, so I think I, I gave that example if, if that's, um, but so when he was five years old, now he, he uh, stepped up on the baseball field first time in a sort of a competitive environment, if you will. And I was throwing balls at, at his face then with a full adult speed and he, he was just reacting. Uh, he was just, and, uh, you know, piece of cake for him, but why? And then of course, what do people say? Oh, such a natural, right? But he's had, of course, training for five years, really, to develop that. Um, while a kid, if, uh, normally, if a ball comes at your face that hard, they would go like this, right? Which would be a natural instinct, but, of course, would not be helpful because that would actually probably hurt them more. It would be better than doing like this and getting a ball sure. in your face. Yeah. <laughs> Right? But of course, this is much more effective or moving your body or doing, doing something right, like that, right? Now he's 16 years old, and last year he was the youngest in the European Championships playing for Team Sweden. But that's uh, then the result of having trained this and his mental skills of being able to perform at high levels. Uh, not because he's the strongest, not because he's the fastest, not because he hits the hardest. Um, but, it's so, uh, but therefore, when it comes to the crucial moments of the game, then not being afraid... Um, of being judged, not being afraid of failure, accepting that it's not going to work every time. But with that mindset, with that kind of training, most of the time it works. And then people notice, why is it, he always so calm? Why does he always perform so well under pressure? Well, well why uh, not? <laughs> well, you, his success validates your teaching and coaching and, and, uh, and your fathering. That's great. And congratulations. That must be uh, very thrilling and gratifying to you. Thank How about you, yes. young adults or older adults who want to get into the game, if you will, whether it's in a corporate sports or singing environment, to learn what you taught your son as an infant. Right, right, exactly. So, so, so why do we uh, become so upset if things don't go well? I'm assuming that's a rhetorical question, but <laughs> because we let ourselves down or our friends or loved ones or we didn't meet expectations or we're not good enough. Exactly, right? And we have these expectations. And what are these expectations? Look, we have high goals. We're high achievers. We, are, we have high ambitions. We want to achieve things in life. This is wonderful. Now, how do we get there? We all know, in theory, that every high achiever has failed enormously. Right. And in business, we know and as entrepreneurs, as, as creative people, we're rejected all the time. Artists are rejected all the time. And most of them can't handle it after a while. It's fun in the beginning, but after a while, it just becomes, uh, you know, it's, it's just too much. So <laughs> but this relationship we have to what we consider then failure, failure of our expectations, somebody else's expectations, it again ties back to our need to be significant, our need to be loved, our need to be recognized, our need to fit in somehow. And, and if we have that awareness then of that's what's going on, and if we can then give ourselves permission to make fools out of ourselves, and I, when I do my live events, I make that joke, right, that I'm here, I ask, has someone ever made a fool out of themselves on stage? Well, if you haven't, watch and learn. <laughs> But that also takes pressure off of myself because now I'm here to be a role model. And hey, now I become comfortable also, right? So it's also for myself, but it's also to encourage other people that when you, what you think is, is high expectations, the truth is when I do that, I suddenly become more alive. I become now more charismatic. People like me more. Oh, I'm become more human. But I, and you know, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Continue. I'm sorry. 
Well, well, I was going to just say in the sports world, uh, people shoot themselves in the foot because they become so upset when things don't go well. They make a mistake, and and it, and it becomes so uh, such a big uh, reaction that then it messes up the next moment, and the next moment, and the next moment too. And now they're suddenly living in the past, and now they're fearful of the future, and it gets all messed up. And now you're certainly not in the zone, right? Yeah. Now, in one way, the first part of what you said kind of harken back to the taking the ego out of the experience. And the second part of what you said about letting the misfortune or the failure or the disappointment carry on and affect future events, yeah. it's not being in the now. You are living in the past or letting the, the, the past failures impact the next event. Right, exactly. On the other hand, that so-called failure, in theory, we know it's a stepping stone to something greater, but how do you use that? How do you actually do it? And this is also part of practicing, and frankly, practicing on a daily basis, not just on the sports field or in the sports that you're engaged in or on stage, but in your daily small things in life. So it is, let's, let's, um, let's take, a, take an example out of the sports world. Let's say, uh, let's say you're in marketing. You're advertising on Facebook, <laughs> which I do and a lot of people do, right? The whole point is that you don't want to succeed. The whole point is to discover what doesn't work because that gives you extremely good information. You want to test something and then you say, okay, that, mm -hmm, uh-huh, right? And it goes back to the old Edison thing about t test, you know, t thousand times, whatever it is to figure out what doesn't work. This is true. This is what we want to do. So again, if my son pitches and it, he, he throws you know, balls, whatever, it, it's not about that. It's the opportunity for adjustment. Is that, oh, this is good information. How interesting. I'm leaning to the left today. Uh-huh. What can I do about that? And then I, if, I, if I have tools, how to adjust, then that's better. But I don't have that tools if I've been freaking out every time in practice because it's not working. And then I try to compose myself or be tough or whatever that means. It doesn't mean anything, right? But if I actually have tools to, okay, adjust my nervous system, adjust my vestibular system. Adjust, if, if I have tools to do that, then th this is beautiful information. Right. And then, therefore, that miss in the beginning of the game or that whatever you call, you know, if someone else calls it failure, we don't. That's perfect. That is what's going to set me up to be able to win the game at the end. Yeah. And I think too many people focus on the reaction to the disappointment or not meeting an expectation rather than focusing on what that experience could teach them, which yes. is exactly what you're saying. So, again, it is it is. It, putting the attention in the wrong aspect of the experience. Yes. I had a beautiful experience when I, in, in my youth, I, I was into track and field mostly. Um, and I ran the hurdles and this guy was trying to psych me out before the race. And I was pretty mentally, mentally strong. So I, will, I will sort of enjoyed those games a little bit. Um, I knew I was going to beat him. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so the race was on, right? And then it's, it's 10 hurdles. Uh, after the nine hurdles, I took a little peek to my right, and, I, and a flash of a thought went through my, uh, my head there. And, and that thought was, yes, I'm winning. And then I fell on the last hurdle. Oh. Now, I could have cried. I could have done it. Was I upset? Of course I was. Um, but. That was such a beautiful learning experience. I realized that for a fraction of a second, I had lost my focus, although it was a positive thought. Huh. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. But if I hadn't done that, and if I have thought, oh, I'm such a loser, I can't believe I did that and beat myself up, and then that would have affected the next race. And what if I have felt twice in a row? Now, how would that affect my whole being, right? It's the, this is what I tend to do. And, but if I instead use that as, I was a beautiful learning experience. That was amazing. Right. I'm so, so, I'm so grateful for that. Right. So it could either be a tool or a weapon. Ah. You use it as a tool, but it could have been your undoing if you focused on 
the negative aspects of it. So the consciousness, as we get into a sports energy and consciousness, keeping that mental framework in that positive realm is such a challenging thing for, for many people, especially when the pressure is greater or the stakes are higher. Yeah. Yes. So how do we affect that? Yeah. Yeah. So this also ties into the awareness of the physiological responses, our nervous system, understanding what fears are, the fight or flight response, the parasympathetic nervous system versus the sympathetic nervous system. How can you affect that? <clears throat> Sometimes it depends on the sport also, right? Sometimes you might need want higher levels of adrenaline going on. Sometimes you don't. It depends what the situation is. It depends on the day. But can we affect that? If you're going into a, um, yeah, like a stage performance, right? Like a, like a, a, a rock singer doesn't want to just be calm. And, yeah, there's something going on there, but what is it? And, and how can you train to affect that? Um, and there's obviously training to do it, right? Train and not just sitting, sitting still and by yourself, but of course, I think every athlete these days have some kind of meditative mindfulness mental practice. Um, I was lucky I got into that in my youth. Um, a lot of visualization training, mental training, um, how to affect my nervous system. And um, so, that's, so that's part of it. And um, what, was the, uh, what was the question? No, no you're, 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 <laughs> you said train your nervous system. Yes. Tell me more about that. What were you doing? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, how, how to train it? Well, there are many ways of doing it. Um, there are all kinds. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really want to, when I was in my youth then, I, I got into, you know, the, the traditional progressive relaxation, which I think still, I still think is a very fundamental thing that everyone should be good at. It, it taps into many, you know, just being able to tense, relax, tense, relax, very, various areas, because it also helps you, the focus of your brain. And then various uh, visualization things, but not also to, I mean, I did a lot of visualization, for example, to learn to run the hurdles. I can learn things in my head before I done them in, in reality. And that's also for stage performance, learning lyrics, uh, learning what you're going to talk about. You can, you can do, do it all in your mind. You don't have to actually speak it out loud if you're going to learn, uh, you know, memorization, but also uh, being on, on stage in that moment, how you put yourself in that, uh, in the environment where you're going to be. Uh, also, what is the visualization going on? What's the camera view? Are you actually inside doing it? Are you looking from the outside? All these kind of things that we're, most people aren't aware of, but as athletes, we learn how to do that. Uh, how can you actually look from different points of view, right? <clears throat> which, which is tricky. But that's training in and of itself to learn how to, how to change the camera angle. I'm sure you've done a lot of that. Yeah, but mostly radio, but I've done some TV. But, but tell me, you yeah. run the race in your mind before you physically do it. And there are physiological manifestations of that in your brain and your being yeah. when you have the confidence and the, and the freedom, as you spoke of earlier, versus the anxiety and the fear, which can overwhelm you. I, I, I didn't only recently learned about the whole phenomenon of negative adrenaline. I have always heard about adrenaline being, you know, the ally that boosts you in the fight or flight mode. You, you, it, it's, it's, pull, it's turned on full on. But I also learned about negative adrenaline, which is the stage fright that overwhelms somebody or the performance anxiety that just takes somebody crashing to the ground, right? Yes. So, uh, yeah, this is really interesting because with the, uh, you know, the fight or flight goes into producing the adrenaline, the cortisol levels, um, which is important. There's a reason we have that response in our nervous system. It is for survival. So we don't want to deny that. There's nothing wrong with experiencing that. It does heighten our awareness. Now, if it then turns into freeze, which is also that response when we actually start freezing it, or it turns into a panic mode, which often becomes a freeze thing, um, then, of course, it's not helpful. But it is a trigger. 
so uh, it it uh, it raises um but you know a lot of those extreme athletes aren't really adrenaline junkies some of them are and i'm sure kristen talked about that in that previous interview that you did with her but um a lot of them are dopamine junkies more if so because dopamine is the reward chemical we feel good and um but it's also highly addictive and of course for athletes i mean for for performers they get such a high now because now they get all the the adulation the the, the love from the crowd and then the day after they suddenly feel so extremely lonely and a lot of athletes can't handle it. That's why they take drugs. They can't handle it even after a performance. They can't get down. Uh, that's why they take drugs. And then they have no clue how to fall asleep. And we've lost athletes because of the simple fact that they do not know how to fall asleep. They don't know how to change, change that, right? And then they think a drug is going to make it happen. A lot of artists, I mean, even violin players take beta blockers because they're afraid the fingers are, are going to, they have to calm the fingers. It's so sad. So that's been part of my, my job also is if I can help influence this thing, you, you, you will actually perform at higher levels, but you also have a longer sustainable career. Plus your life will be happier. Right. Now, now it's not just a kick of being, uh, being, doing that, extreme sports or being on on stage or getting the love from the crowd but you can actually be fulfilled being by yourself also so um oh there's so much to talk about here i'm sorry yeah, if I'm that's just no stuff. that's great you really nailed it and you know talk to me more about the dopamine that surges in your being when you get that performance adulation as you as you yes now your brain is saying well we have all this dopamine Tomorrow, I don't have to make as much because you just flooded your whole, <laughs> your whole brain and being with it. And you have that dopamine depletion in the aftermath. So yes. you have to learn how to ride that roller coaster or regulate your reaction and hence physiologically manage that, right? Yes, you do. And unfortunately, a lot of artists don't. And again, it comes back to the beginning. We want to be loved. We want to fit in. We want to belong. That's a big reason why artists become artists in the first place. Or at least they want to express something. Or even writing, you know, this, the creativity, being able to express something. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, geez, what would life be without art or without people creating solutions to problems? But then being up on stage and getting that feedback, wow, I'm finally loved, right? It's amazing. How can thousands of people they're just and i'm i have this ability now being a performer being able to create this energy in the room where we're all bonding together and we're all singing together or clapping our hands together doing something together learning together if you have a lecture or something like that it's, i mean, it's a beautiful thing but now this fulfills everything i and then not only the dopamine, but the serotonin, the oxytocin of this, this bonding together, right? And we, we feel like it, it's amazing. So what about the, the, yeah, but what about the next day? Uh, and what, are some of the, what are some of the, the, the methodology that you would use in your coaching to deal with that roller coaster? So you can sustain the level of peace and tranquility and, and high performance without the pitfalls, like so many athletes and professional ball players, when their careers are over, suffer tremendous anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, in addition to their financial woes and whatnot and health woes. Exactly, yes. And there, I think we tap into the, the spiritual consciousness of understanding that what we do it has a higher purpose. And if when we tap into that, and this is part of also where meditative practices can be very helpful, right? That we recognize that I'm part of something bigger. And, um, uh, and that's what all, all spiritual practices are for, right? Or, or tend to uh, encourage. And I think that is huge. I think that is so important. So therefore, when we are doing whatever we are, whatever it is that we are doing, there's actually some greater purpose to it. And therefore, it actually feeds a greater sense of gratitude within me. Uh, 
now it and you mentioned ego before right now it's not it becomes less and less of the self-serving gratification of that i need to be seen i need to uh, to uh, get the recognition i need to be rewarded i need to be loved now it becomes more about that that um i actually don't need that it's nice um don't deny that but there's something else i'm now actually on stage for for a purpose to serve not just that audience but actually serve there's a reason why let's say we're lecturing or we have a speech or we have a concert whatever it is i'm now there to create an experience for everyone else who has come and this is something that they will bring with them the memory of that they will bring with it and and they will enhance their lives in some way and therefore if i can feel that that sense of purpose or in the sports field also the reason i i win a game is to be a role model for what's possible the reason i am be able to come back from an injury the reason i am able to uh, turn a game around is not just self serving it is for the team it is for but it's frankly it's for the other team too because i want to be a role model for what's possible right and that's why competition is such a beautiful thing thing also because now it's not about beating someone else now it's about making someone better and the truth is that i'm going to win this game but you're going to become better from it and if you're going to win you're going to be able to have to play the best game you've ever played <laughs> yeah and there, and there and there's no game without the competitor exactly you have uh, the game within yourself but there's no full athletic measure without a rival or a, an opponent or uh, you know a challenge has to that's, that's right and therefore if you win i will congratulate you because i did all i could and you raised my game and i wasn't able to pull it off this time but i'm looking forward to next time now it's not failure right yes no. i could i could have done things better yes yes and now i want to put that into practice so now it's like my falling in the hurdle thing now it becomes a reward thing yes i lost fine now i'm fired up i want to use what i learned i want to i want to go at it again and why because it's a service for the audience they have paid money to see it if i'm a professional um but it's also for it be a role model for whatever my family my kids whatever it might might be right and that's why falling down becomes so valuable that therefore i'm not a failure that's therefore, right right and then but but again that is so important coming back to that withdrawal thing that i'm not suddenly good enough my career is over no you what do you mean career is over you've done your thing that you were supposed to do you did it at your level you did it beautifully um right maybe you didn't have the you didn't want to work out as hard as those who became even better at you did that's fine you did it at your level and mm -hmm. maybe you didn't have the so called natural thing cuz you know, whatever but you did what you could right? right when i did my sports thing i didn't i knew nothing about strength training <laughs> right so uh, if i had known well but uh, yeah i did what i did and i've learned so much from it yes i wanted to be an olympian was i ever close of course not is that failure of course not but people say oh you shouldn't you shouldn't have those goals of being an olympian that's a stupid dream i love that dream it fired me up to learn something i wanted to train right it's not failure i did something with it and I'm still grateful for having that dream. I've always been a dreamer. I have crazy dreams. So, what's wrong with that? No, keep dreaming. Keep dreaming. So, it's about focusing on the process, the experiential benefit and beauty and not judging your success or so-called failure on the outcome. Can I go back to you calling yourself a prodigy as a violinist? Glenn Albaugh, who is a great psychologist and author and a friend of the Sports Energy Consciousness Group, uh, spoke with us recently, and I mentioned Joe Montana having this incredible sixth sense, this gift of vision and whatever, and he, he took great issue with that. He said, no, that was a trained talent. It wasn't an intrinsic gift. Can you address some of those thoughts related to when you were described to yourself as a prodigy in violin? It didn't just manifest out of thin air. I'm, I'm sure you had a gift, but it was cultivated, and it yes. wasn't 
it, it wasn't just a magical occurrence. That's really interesting that he said that. Um, yeah, singing, and I didn't sing uh, as a kid, but I'll get, I'll get back to the violin playing. But singing is, strangely enough, one of those things that people think that either you have it or you don't which is something that really troubles me, which is, I think, why I perhaps went into that field that I need to change the mindset here. It's a skill, like, why can't you improve it? And then people make jokes out of how bad they sing, right? I mean, fine, we can make jokes out of things, but how much have you trained? Not much, right? And people who say that they don't like to sing, they say it because they don't think they sound good. So let's face it, but every culture sings, every child sings. We could argue that we all sang before we were able to construct words into sentences because we express with our voice. Now, an adult world who wants to judge would say, ah, you're not singing, you're off key, and that's not, you know, but is expressing with our voice, right? So when I played the violin then, um, it, of course things c came easily to me and, and I don't remember my experience the first weeks if it was sudden, something sudden. I don't think so. I probably saw, I mean, violin is one of those instruments that just doesn't sound good in the beginning. It just doesn't. I had patient parents. I had, I had parents who, uh, who installed uh, sort of a, a discipline. I was always practicing half hour a day because I was supposed to, and that's how it is. If I sign up, then I do it. I, it's not a big deal. Nothing was forced on me, but it was just a practice that why not, right? You do that before you, before you have, yeah. So, um, so I got into a, a habit of practicing and then I had a teacher who, who, uh, who challenged me. If I had done the easy stuff, it probably would have been boring fast. He gave me difficult stuff. So um, I, I guess they realized that I fed off that. I, that inspired me. So I wanted to figure out, okay, how can I get my fingers moving so I could play this piece by Friday? And that was sort of the process. So even though, though I was practicing half an hour, I probably practiced far more effectively than my friends. And I, in fact, I saw many friends how they practiced. And to me, it wasn't all that surprising that they didn't develop all that fast. But there's no strategy. There's no thing. There's no awareness also, right? So if I tried to get my fingers moving, what am I doing here? What's the process? What are my fingers doing? What's my wrist doing? What's happening? Getting into that a, a deep focus, you know, deep learning, like uh, or rather getting into the, the zone. But I didn't know anything about these, these terms, right? I didn't know what's going on in my brain. I just wanted to learn this freaking piece. And how do I do that? But after a while, I, I realized that I've actually practiced not, well, maybe also more than other people because it's consistent, even though it's just half an hour a day. But, but there's, a, there's a strategy and there's an awareness while I do it. So the same thing now with singers, um, it's, what you, it's not how much you do it, but it's the awareness you have when you do something. Same thing when we're throwing baseball or batting. What, is, uh, what are your hips doing? What, what, what's happening right there? What's happening in your body? What happened in your brain right there when you did that? Oh, isn't that interesting? Ah, mm, there was a little thought of it shifted from here to there. Ah, mm. All these things, which becomes a fun game, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun to practice that way. And it's impossible not to achieve fast results. Let me ask you, 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 you must have been a precocious kid because you, you sound like you were mere mature beyond your years in learning the violin. But how about so many who say, oh, I hated playing the piano, but my mom and dad made me, or I hated doing this, but that required discipline or that mandated discipline by the parent eventually went from disdain to to enjoyment yeah. and that process <laughs> is a fascinating one so i would love to hear your your analysis of that or your your theory your, your thoughts on that yeah uh, uh, look, that's a tough one how do you get inspired to, to want to do something more and more and more um, because if you find some kind of joy in doing an activity, whatever it might be, like a puzzle, you want to do it again the next day. And again, it's the, door, it's the reward. It's some kind of feeling of reward. I'm getting something out of this, right? And how do you encourage that? Like a parent to a kid, that's, that's frankly tough. So for me, 
Uh, being a musician, I was a little bit cautious with my kids because I didn't want to force it upon them. On the other hand, I know, I know that the reason I got the results is because I had a discipline. And I feel a little bit bad, perhaps, that I didn't enforce that kind of discipline with my kids when it came to playing an instrument. And they don't play an instrument now. They had some joy from it, but they didn't find the passion from it. So I don't know. Should I have been a little tougher on that and been, been a little more rigorous so that they therefore would have experienced the beauty of progress and therefore wanting to do more of it? Um, because they certainly had what you would call talent. They had a sense of rhythm, had a sense of all mm -hmm. the you know, musicality. Um, so they don't play instruments. So I don't know. I feel a little bit guilty in one sense that I didn't do that. On the other hand, like my son with playing baseball, he was out in the backyard and he was throwing balls at the garage door all, all the time and we couldn't make him stop, right? So he found something there. He just wanted to do more and more of it. And then yeah. he... When he changed from softball to hardball, there was suddenly a hole in the garage door <laughs> there. And, Fran and the hole was right in the center of where we had painted the nice. strike zone. So that was nice. <laughs> so we gave that to him. But he was out there just doing it over and over and over again, right? So, but he probably wouldn't have found that unless we had started with these games of throwing and playing either. So, that, so that's a tough one. How do you... Uh, how do you find your passion? How do you find something you love to do? I don't know. I don't know. Well, well, you're, you're sharing a lot. You, you're saying you don't know, but you're revealing more than you realize. And in many ways, I would think it's safe to say it's tougher to be a parent than it is to be a coach because you were burdened, if you will, by the fear that you would be giving too much to your kids in the way you wanted it and the way you had it. So yes. you avoided that almost to a fault the way you're describing it so maybe you overcompensated but that's such a challenging yeah. thing you hear it so many times uh, the great athlete or the great musician or the great whatever it might be being very careful not to you know force it upon their offspring because right. of the I mean, how do you fill big daddy or big mom's shoes when you're one of the best in the world at what you do whatever the pursuit might be Exactly. And, and as we know, there have been tons of great athletes, great people who have lived with that kind of pressure through their lives, but they have also expressed later in life that that doesn't give them the joy and the satisfaction. Yes, they became, became great. So, you know, it's a tough one. It's, it's uh, yeah, um, motivation by fear works also. You know, being, having dominating coaches, dominating who is all fear, Sometimes it does work. People do become good at it, but they also become addicted sometimes, right? And artists, we've had artists who have had domineering parents who have become world-class artists, but then have succumbed to drugs and stuff like that because right. they've never, never been feel fulfilled and they've never feel, felt that kind of love. So again, what is it that we want to achieve? Do we just want to achieve winning um, by intimidation or do we want to achieve some kind of fulfillment in our lives that ultimately inspires people to at a high level, right? What, what price of glory or of fame or fortune? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been fascinating, Per, and I, I want to just close with our focal point on the Omni Athlete, the name of our program, which is the kind of the, the amalgam of the mind, body, sport athlete. And if you could kind of summarize or distill for us your view on how that all comes together in peak performance and getting in the zone. Okay, well, I think it's a beautiful wor word. We use omni as the all encompassing, um, all the, I mean, in a sense, I consider everyone to be a speaker and a singer. And perhaps we could argue that we are all athletes also. And then if we make money, our professionals, or then that's something, something different, right? But we all, express with our bodies in some way in our with our physiology physicality uh, which i think is a beautiful thing and we all know it's health, healthy for us also it's he healthy to express with our voice uh, with our creativity and it's healthy to express with our bodies in physical activities so i think that's beautiful now if we are then w want to do that on higher levels then to be able to embrace these things that we've talked about, the awareness of the physical body, the desire to want to improve it, the awareness that it can be improved dramatically, and there are different strategies to do that, that the mind and body is not the separation these days, 
it obviously goes all hand in hand, right? Whatever comes first, (laughs) but everything is affected by everything. And that also, yeah. So so all these things about the, the the actual skills that we use to affect our, our mental awareness, mental skills, affecting our nervous system, affecting our uh, visual and vestibular system, all of these things. There's so many wonderful methods and it's all evolving and, the knowledge that we have of our brain now versus what we had only 10, 20 years ago is pretty, pretty remarkable. So if we can use that then to excel at higher levels, but then also then that becomes then a bigger purpose like we talked about. It becomes sort of a, well, first of all, it feeds the gratitude in us that we do what we do for a bigger purpose. Uh, we learn, we have a gratitude for learning, we have gratitude for all our failures, and which is the learning, right? And then, but then also how that then creates a bond between us as, as human beings. And I think sports and music are those things that really bond human beings. Yeah, we can talk about rivalry and stuff like that, but ultimately, we're all one. We want the rivalry because we love it. The audience loves it, but also, also because, like we talked about, the athlete loves the competition because it makes me better. I'm making you better. And when we have all these world ch- championships, World Cups, Olympics, and all s- stuff, it's all about bringing people together, right? So I think, and that's what music does too. So it's, it's a beautiful thing to bring the energy of human beings together. Sure. And the interconnectivity, I guess we can say the uh, some of the parts can exceed the whole and take us to places we, we never even imagined. So. Yes. Isn't that so? That's great. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to know you and uh, hearing your great insights and congratulations on a super career and continue wonderful success. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you. As always, guys, if this content is adding value to your lives and specifically to your performance as an athlete or as a coach, please, please, please like and share our content so that we can grow this community. That's what we're after right now is just growing this community and helping as many athletes and coaches as possible access the teachings on peak performance, mental and emotional self-management, spirituality, love, achieving what it feels like to be in the zone and in a flow state, and everything that it is to be an omni-athlete. We want to get this message out to as many people as possible, and we need your help to do it. So if it's adding value, and it's truly helping you as an athlete or as a coach, please like and share this content. And until next time, guys, mind open, eyes wide, feel into it, play. Play.